Hi, Yaz, Chucky here from the LGFA, and uh, I'm very happy to be joined for a very special LGFA show today by three uh, special guests. Um, so as I look at my screen on the top left-hand side, I have uh, Dr. Lynette Hughes, former Tyrone star, um, is on the call. Sarah Wall of Mead, uh, 2020 TG Carroll All-Ireland Intermediate winner, is also on the call. Bottom left-hand side of my screen, and LGFA Development Officer, uh, with remit for referee and player development, Claire Dowdle, a very good friend of mine, is also on the call. Ladies, how are we today? All good? Great. Good, yeah. Excellent. So we're talking about peer support and resilience today are our key cornerstones of the conversation. Claire, I'll come to you first and just to tee up um, what viewers can expect uh, from this uh, call and this session today. Yeah, um, I just think it's sort of under our player welfare, player education branch. Um, that we're going to talk about today and we've done some work with webinars Lynette was actually on one with us there and um, we're really focusing on the peer support and the resilience and um, like if the players are having setbacks how they've dealt with them and um, leaning on friends and being able to talk to people and I think probably with the country opening up again as well Jackie it's probably more relevant now than ever too. Yeah, there is light at the end of the tunnel, which is which is great. Um, Dr. Lynette Hughes, you played 16 years for Tyrone Seniors. This is the, the bio that's been given to me by Claire. Uh, an Ulster senior title along the way as captain. Uh, Ulster Interpro for 10 years. LGFA All-Star. Uh, Ulster Ladies Player of the Year. College Football with UUJ. Um, and one of the other pieces that jumped out a mile to me, um, you're married for 12 years with seven children. How do you keep everything together Lynette tell me what's the secret uh plenty of prayer every day and <laughs> um, yeah just one day at a time you know like having technology is focusing on the controllables and not sweating the small stuff so that helps us to relax um I suppose the way I look at children people always talk about the family life you know I trained six times a week for 16 years with your own ladies put everything on the line for it and it was for a piece of metal that size so when you compare that then to children it, it, it just it's not that big a deal I, well that's just the attitude I take in it you know it, it's 90% of life is, is perception and what you perceive it to be so if you perceive something to be awful and to be very stressful the same thing you know in football you go and you see a lot of cones some people perceive that to be an awful session ahead of them other people perceive it to be brilliant. It's a challenge. I seem to be one of those people who likes lots of cones. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, I'm sure at the moment, uh, the recent emphasis of um, Lynette's piece that she did with us was bouncing back and building resilience. Um, and Sarah, we spoke recently with a, with a piece with you in the, in the next issue of Pell Magazine. Uh, obviously, as a reference at the top of the show, 2020 TG Carroll all Ireland Intermediate winner with Mead. Um, sister of Vicky Wall, who was Intermediate Player of the Year. Um, Sarah, unfortunately, you're on the, the, the rehab route again. So tell us, uh, December 20, 2020 was, uh, was a bittersweet day for you in many ways. You ended up with an All-Ireland medal, but you also ended up, unfortunately, with, with, uh, with, with an ACL. Yeah, literally, you just said it there, it was bittersweet, obviously. The wind definitely took a lot of the sting out of the injury, and obviously I didn't really know fully then what it was but I did have my kind of inclinations of what it was just from doing it before and kind of the pop but um no it was definitely made it that bit easier to kind of afterwards still be able to enjoy myself and say look like this doesn't come around very often so I said there's no point really dwelling on it. like the I think I had three weeks up until my MRI and actually I had the MRI a couple of days after but I didn't know for around three weeks and um, so I said I wasn't going to dwell on it then because it was just you kind of be stressing over it twice and you don't want to worry about something that's going to happen regardless really so I said I would just kind of go along with it anyway but um yeah and I was three month marker today 20th um so just chipping away really at the moment trying to get back into kind of hopping just more kind of strength and aerobic type of stuff now okay so you're making progress which is good to hear and I'll bring Claire and and Lynette in on this as well um Lynette, so uh, obviously Sarah is in a place where she suffered a traumatic event and not for the first time, unfortunately. It's, it's her second 
uh, time, uh, suffering an ACL. And Sarah, when we spoke on the phone, you, you were making the point that you think this one is just a little bit more difficult. Is that maybe the other external factors that we have at the moment? We're in lockdown and it's just obviously you knew the, 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 the road ahead of you after doing it the first time. So to do it again, I'm sure you were thinking, God, I have to go through this again. Have you come to terms with it a little bit more since or... As yeah. you say, today is a three month block and it's a, it's yeah. a little milestone in that, you know, OK, yeah. I'm getting there. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I've come, come to terms with it a lot more now. I think, yeah, at the start, I was just kind of like, oh, God, like I didn't expect to be here again. Really, I think it was four years since I did my first run. So I kind of thought I was over it. But I suppose with these type of injuries, you're never really far from once you're playing a contact sport, like you're always going to be subjected to getting hits anything like that so you're never fully like far away from it but um no definitely at the start I was just kind of like why me in a sense that like I went through it already but no at this time yeah I'm just kind of you have to kind of get over that phase a bit kind of just kind of throw your temper tantrum and then just get to a stage where you're just like okay look I have the year I can either go through that now or keep doing this and just get nowhere really and I want to get back playing so that's what I have to do really Okay. Claire, I mean, I, I think Sarah has a really strong message of, you know, if we're talking about resilience to, to come back from it in the first, uh, you know, uh, you were in school, um, Sarah, when you got the first one on a blitz in DCU, but to come back from that and make a big impact with Mead and, and to suffer this setback again, and but to be so determined to get back on the field to play it as good times ahead for Mead, Claire, going up to senior football. Um, so yeah. it's a strong message that Sarah has for us today. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, um, and it's one of them unfortunate things people say if you do it once, you're unlucky. But to do it twice, I'm being so young, um, so you have to be mentally really strong. I think is probably the challenge. The physical stuff, there's support there from the physiotherapists, the the training programs. But it, it's very. I know it can be a very lonely place. Um, when you're having an injury and trying to come back, and it's more the mental side of it. Uh getting out climbing back out of that and I think it's just about for me I I've, I had a really bad back injury there last year mm. and I just know from my own self as well it's small goals really helped me just and, and being around people see being up around the club and I know different people don't like seeing their team or don't be in but I, I was still up trying to coach and just even talking to different coaches different parents and, and that support I know for me personally I needed that that connection um to, to help me through it so and Lynette, I think it, it's been proven in studies um, from a psychological viewpoint that it's very important for the injured player to stay involved in that in that team environment and that group environment and, and the support of peers at this time. And if, if it is at all possible, and at the same time, you know, Sarah's gone through this before, if there is like minded people who have gone through similar experiences to, you know, birds of a feather flock together, as the old saying. Oh, definitely. The research is awash with papers that liken a serious injury for athletes to the same experience of grief to losing a loved one. So it gives you an idea whenever I hear about somebody doing an ACL or an injury that's going to be months in the rehab, I automatically think of between the two years because that's where the biggest battle will take place. Um, our bodies are brilliant and they're predisposed to healing, um, but they heal in their own time. And a lot of our problem is the impatience with that and what we're missing, what we'd like to do, what everybody else is still doing. And that's not a physical burden um, in us, but it's more a psychological burden because it's constantly reminding us what we would like to be doing, what we used to do and how we used to do it and how easy we used to do it. Um, so there's these different kind of pivotal moments in our lives, such as injuries or sickness. And again, you generally find that those who tune in between the two years and try to see it through new eyes, um, adjust the quickest and that's not to say that you just say oh yeah this is great I've got an injury you're totally human in it so you be angry and frustrated and depressed and vexed you have to add on to that the biochemical factors that when we're used to training especially at county level like Sarah you're training maybe five six times a week you're getting constant boosts of your serotonin and your dopamine your really good feel good hormones rushing through your body um, and that's one of the biggest losses in terms of not being able to train again. And it's also one of the biggest challenges then mentally, because, you know, before you get injured, you can just go to training and you come back feeling a million dollars. You feel energized. You feel great having been in the group. 
when you're injured, you don't get that endorphin release. You might be there, but you're still not fully in the team. So as it's good to see the girls and maybe it's good to have a conversation, it's still very hard when you maybe you're standing at the side of a field and you're trying to move up and down two inches, you know, whilst they're running miles, you know. So um, I do think that there's a body of work maybe needed in terms of just keeping the players alongside the team and equally asking how you get on. You know, I, now, you know, we've had a few bad injuries in our teams uh, locally and, and I don't even ask about the knee or the hip or whatever. I'm like, well, what about between the two ears? How are you getting on? Because it is, that's a really big challenge. Um, and so it's important that you, you know, you cry your tears and you get angry and you get frustrated. Um, and then once you process all of that, then you focus on the controllables. So we all too often focus on what we can't do, but it's like, well, what can I do? So on every day, if you, I do believe if you, if you keep between the two ears positive, every other day will look after itself because you'll try a little bit that day to get you back to where you want to go. Yeah, I spoke about the, 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 the trauma of that injury, Lynette, and, and back in the day I studied uh, sports psychology in, in Waterford IT and the Kubler-Ross model we, we, we dealt with and those five stages that you talk about, Sarah, I'm sure you can, you can relate to them. There's denial, you know, uh, oh God, it's not this again, you know, surely it's not, and then you're angry, you're bargaining, um, uh, you, maybe there's a, a small touch of you know feeling very low, i.e. a little bit depressed over it, and then finally that I think where you are now is the acceptance piece. Do all of those stages feel a little bit familiar? I think they feel way too familiar, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, definitely. I I'd agree with everyone what they said there. Kind of the whole team perspective of it. That I remember I was just talking to one of my teammates during the week, and she was talking about the first time I did it on how I would kind of have a routine. I'd go down when the girls were training at the club and I'd kind of do my runs first and then I'd go into the gym myself, but I would still have that connection with them at the start. Yeah. I think I've definitely found that a bit, a lot tougher kind of this time that it's just in your house, like you're by yourself and you just kind of have to go along, kind of do your work at home and then you're staying at home doing your rehab. And that's why I think I found it a bit tougher kind of starts to kind of get to the acceptance phase, just kind of the whole, it is lonely, like it is lonely, like um injury injury regardless and then lockdown you kind of it's the best of both worlds in the sense that i'm not missing out on other things that people like we're all in the same boat but then just the whole rehab type of thing that you're, you're by yourself constantly like so claire in that sense how important is the work that lynette and others are are, are doing um oh. to ensure that players have you know su support to, to call upon when, when they find themselves in situations like this I think it's more than ever, and it's it's probably something we don't talk enough about, Jackie. Um, as, as Lena put it really well, between the years, we don't really um say you know you're going to have a, a a low, a dip, and and how you're gonna how you're gonna start that conversation with somebody. I think is the big thing to say. Look, I am feeling low, and it's not a it, it's not my knee that's sore. It's my head that's sore today, um, and we just have to keep putting it out there that it's okay and you're going to feel like that and that there's people there to talk to and there's resources out there and even if you don't want to go down that route talk to a friend talk to a coach talk to talk to anybody but to get that message out there that there's people there to support you within it and the work that's being done in the minute I, I just can't say it enough it, it's we have two partnerships one at the minute with Jigsaw yeah in the whole youth mental health with the one good club and we're just trying to bring all of them messages out to the front more and then we're working with the northern ireland youth forum um in the six counties just trying to get that out there that it, that it's okay to, to talk to somebody and you know say you're not feeling the best yeah it's very important to do it particularly in the times that we're living in as well um you know, as you're working as a consultant mental health researcher as well um and uh, coaching locally as well so in terms of the people that you, you deal with, um, is there, I'm sure there's, there's many sports people that you, you, you've worked with uh, uh, through the years, Lynette. Yeah, from very backgrounds, um, really, Jackie, I would have had different athletes come at different stages. My own PhD research was in burnout. So different athletes who have maybe crashed and burned at the peak of their game, and they're really trying to rebuild the blocks, the foundation blocks, and they're really wrestling with trying to get back into sport at all again. Um, and also letting go of a lot of prized goals. And um, the same thing more locally, players, and you generally find that it's transitions. As human beings, we don't necessarily like change. So it's transitions, maybe lost jobs, uh, maybe 
going to college and trying to manage life on your own and maybe not doing it the right way between all of the, the culture that goes on there. And a lot of parents would come um, at different stages. So the things like young girls with eating disorders. Um, so there's a very, there's a very mix. My own background before I went self-employed was working within vacant centres for young people who had severe and enduring mental illness, who had exited psychiatric inpatient care and who were trying to then become rehabilitated um, in the social world. And I suppose from that work, I would do anything to prevent someone from getting to that end point. Um, you know, where you're totally disempowered in psychiatric care. And one of the, the biggest protective factors in terms of resilience is person control. And so to really like promote young people across the board, whether you're playing sport or not, to really see, well, what is it in my personal control? What can I change? What can I do better? What do I need to park that has really taken me down? And these, a lot of the time, especially in adolescence, are our own thoughts. Um, which are embedded a lot of time within media messages, social media, you know, the more and more research is coming out in terms of the negative effects of social media and phones in terms of anxiety and depression on youths and um, the gambling, you know, paddy power in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So it's dealing with real life issues. And, you know, I think we do young people a great disservice by not letting them know what are the things that put them at risk and what are the things that protect them. So. All too often we kind of do we tap on the shoulder and say, oh, you'll, you'll be grand. And, and we head off on our merry way. But there's other factors at play here. So I suppose I've been very fortunate in terms of being able to, to look at the bigger picture um, and to walk with with one to ones and um, with people who are maybe struggling with things at a time and to be able to reassure people who are injured or people who are depressed or people who have eating disorders or anxiety is that it's a moment in time, but it, it, it's not your life story. You know, but sometimes when, when you're in that, you think it's your life story and you can't see past it. So it's really about letting people say, hang on a second, don't go to the catastrophic end point. This is a moment in time. And the thing with building resilience is that it's dealing with adversity, but it's being strengthened with adversity. And too often it's our lack of patience that can't see actually well, we're getting stronger at the other side, you know, that we've come back stronger. We've learned an awful lot about ourselves. We've learned a lot about maybe my goals and motivations or what I have to change. So it's being strengthened. So, you know, our mantra, our children are all primary school, but my mantra, and they probably are fed up listening, is pain and suffering is a part of life. You know, so what are you going to do with it? So the days that you don't have it, those are days to smile from ear to ear. And the days that you do have it, you still have to try and find the reasons to keep smiling, you know? <laughs> so it's about trying to kind of just instill that because we've kind of gone a bit happy clappy probably the last 20 years where everything's wonderful and everything's great. And it's all very surface level, but deep down, we can't fool our young people who, you know, are dealing with real life events and the, the tokenism doesn't serve them well. So I like to kind of go with the issues that are at play and really walk with them and to have the honest conversations that, all too often we try to avoid. I love your attitude um, because you talk about the, the happy clappy piece um, and it's probably we're gone all happy clappy at a time where we're probably dealing with the with arguably the worst mental health crisis in, 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 in the state's history. So it's a, there are some brilliant points that you make. Um, Sarah, just when, when, when Lynette was talking there, it, it just struck me in terms of, you know, peer support and resilience that it's, it's not just in, in, in Mead's journey overall it's not just confined to to recovering from injuries i mean you also suffered two all ireland final defeats in a row before you finally got over the line at the third time of asking and, and tyrone were responsible for one of those lynette as you know a couple of years ago so sarah just in terms of the group environment and the group mentality mentality and the group dynamic i mean how did you as a group manage to recover from losing to tyrone in an all ireland final to to losing to, to tipperary in an all ireland final to finally and cracking the code at, at the third time of asking I, I get I got a sense watching me that day it was very much a case of you know not today this is not going to happen again today yeah um that was literally one of our key phrases we all used coming up to the final we had our own psychologist Kelly who really helped us for the last two years around so yeah the first high round one was a hit like but I don't think like we were very young going into that and like we were a young team anyway but like it was the first experience Croke Park first kind of major 
final we were in for a good while like me it was hit hard kind of with management problems and it just wasn't really cohesive for a while in the senior panel um, and then Tipperary, Tipperary we thought we were there we were close but it was just like you're nearly over the edge and then you just you fell so that hurt us all a lot but definitely I think this year it was just our focus was it, we just had a steel focus like it was just we knew what we've been through for the last two years and the lads put so much hard work into us and that we were, were physically and mentally prepared. And I don't think we'd been both of them for the previous two years that like Kelly had us prepared going into the game being like, say when the goals went in, I remember asking all the girls afterwards being like, did any of you actually panic? And all of us were like, no, nobody actually panicked whatsoever because we had practiced so much before being like, Okay, so we're in a game situation. You're three goals down. You have 10 minutes left. Okay, let's play this game scenario. And then we prepare ourselves as well, being like, we still had, what, 50, 40 minutes left on the clock. Like, why panic now? The game is still going on. Like, so our whole mentality was not today. Like, we just weren't going to allow it. Like, it was our day. That was why we came there and what we were going to do. So I definitely think we did have kind of everything, mental blocks and physical blocks set up correctly that year. You were ready for the what ifs, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, all the scenarios were pre pre played and pre planned in advance. And then, at full time, um, to bring a little light into proceedings, Sarah. So there you are. You're hobbling around, uh, ready to join <laughs> the celebrations. Vicky uh, gives you a piggyback, <laughs> and then suddenly she's yeah. summoned over to TG Car for the player of the match uh, presentation and an interview, and she just decides to drop you. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's very funny to look back now. I saw it on everybody's stories and everything. It was very funny, but we were doing it. And after she's like, I swear, like, I was trying to bring you over. I, I swear I didn't put you down on purpose, really. But yeah, it was a nice little moment to have. A lot of people actually said to me she was probably sent off. It was like a reason for her to be sent off, that she was able to be with me on the sideline. So it was a nice little touch to the end to have her there. Because uh, I have photos, actually, that Dad would always take on every matches at all the matches and um it was a previous the two previous years there's always photos of us basically hugging but crying and this year we we're hugging and crying but it was the best possible outcome we could have got so it was nice to be like oh we got the nice photo and we were there together because we'd always go to each other first really so it was nice yeah it was terrific and and, and a, a, an element of vicky's story that i want to touch on and, and claire and Lynette, i'm sure you will have seen it since and it was an extremely brave piece by Vicky and it feeds into what we're talking about here is uh, the fact that when Vicky uh, was interviewed in relation to her Intermediate Player of the Year award and it went out on TG Carr, she took the opportunity to to speak about um, her experiences of being uh, verbally abused about her weight, um, Sarah. Were you aware of of, of Vicky's story in, the, in that sense and... Um, would she have spoken to you about it or would she have bottled it up or what way did she deal, deal, deal with it? Well, you know, as, as your sister, you're obviously very, very close of a huge bond and love for each other. What way was she with you around all of that? I think I was, and I wasn't aware of it that like, say kind of in the times that we are, that we're all talking about there, that it is kind of just like the happy clappy that you have to just kind of like, Oh, sure. We're winning matches. That's all that matters. Um, but like, She's definitely one of the players like in every team I've been on that everyone would really look up to, but she would just get so much abuse, like regardless of any match, like however she played. And she always dealt with it very well, but you could see kind of after match, after match, it would just affect her a lot. Like, not like she would always kind of keep it to herself some of the times, but um, yeah, no, it's that like kind of mentality that you're, a spectator so you have the right to talk about anybody on the pitch as if it's kind of just you can open like talk freely like when in like you really can't like that's not your situation to talk on somebody's weight it's not your situation to really like yes you can say somebody had a bad game and everything but you don't really know what's going on at home in the bigger picture like and then people just they did really tear into her at some games, just she's a fabulous player. Like, and when you have that talent, people are always going to try and find like you downgrades basically in the negative side of that. Um, but 
like she'd always go and train so hard train and then come home and try and eat clean the entire time like she put so much hard work in and then sometimes she would do that still be working so hard and she'd still get those comments so it was just hard like yeah. um but I don't think she was as vocal like towards all of us really like we didn't know she was going to talk about that in the interview but um we're all extremely proud of her for talking about that because it is a taboo topic like and one that so many girls and lads go through but it's just not talked about really so yeah, i remember i actually tweeted yeah. that night of the show so I was, I, I was really sad that it happened to her and a little bit ashamed that it, it was you know you know part of an organization where that would happen um but clear in an overall sense i think what vicky did was shone a light on something that really needs to be uh, as, as sarah says talked about a little bit more yeah definitely the, the way i see it is jackie if somebody was calling you names like that in the street people would be outraged you know so why would we accept it on a, a field of play where something that's everybody's supposed to love and cherish and a place where the players are supposed to be able to go out and show their talent and showcase it off and there just is really no place in our game for it but it was so brave of her to do that and she obviously felt like she had a lot of support behind her to, to make that decision when she had the I think the stage to do it but she had such a great year um, that, that she was able to open it up like that and I think it'll benefit everybody I'm sure she's been contacted by loads of girls probably on Instagram or DM'd or other people that have had this and it's just shining a light on it and being a real role model and it speaks more about her resilience to keep coming back to the well every time um, and, and to keep on leading her team because I always look back at that even all Ireland final like when she scored that goal that's one of the best goals I ever seen but that was just after you were injured sir and I swear to God you would have thought she just went that that this this nobody's stopping me. This is for my sister. This goal, this All Ireland final, and it shows, I think, how mentally brave she is, and and the fact in what she has said after that, just it, it's phenomenal. And and hopefully we all pick up on it and become more understanding and become more kind and realize, you know, just because they're on a pitch, we can't call them anything we want. It just can't happen. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a topic that we need to talk more about for sure. Um, she she said um, in that piece actually on TG Car, if you far gone down, uh, she had the, the she, she just got so angry after you got injured, Sarah, that nothing was going to stop her going through for that goal. But you might recall, uh, Claire, actually she scored a goal very similar to that in the All Ireland semi final the year before at Nolan Park. Um, I'm trying to get the years right with COVID. You, you wouldn't know what year, you know, what day you have half the time, but just the power, the pace, the uh, just a phenomenal player, and that should supersede absolutely everything. Um, Lynette, but I think just coming back and uh, you know rounding it back a little bit, uh, you know, in, in that team environment, um, when you talk about resilience, you can talk about resilience and bouncing back from a defeat. You can talk about resilience on your way back from injury, but you also, I think, we also need to acknowledge the resilience that it takes for 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 somebody like um, Vicky to deal with what she's had to deal with, but people from diverse backgrounds are. Um, in terms of sexuality whatever the case may be to to get into that team environment and to to maybe have to be subjected to some stuff but to keep coming back and keep coming back that takes a special type of character doesn't it that's resilience in action you know um we should take it as a compliment that they're giving us abuse because if they weren't we wouldn't be a threat you know um you should always be wary if your opposition or the people you're against have absolutely no problem with you <laughs> because um, you're probably no threat to what they want to do. And unfortunately, you know, whether we like it or not, the sporting environment is a place, you know, between four white lines, the most level of human being can just be transformed in the heat of a moment. So that's where it's very important not to personalise things and not to take it as personal attack on you, as uh, you know, but I always felt that it was good to flip that on and say, it. you know, I had similar experiences when I was playing myself. I used to be told that I togged out massive <laughs> and I was built like a man. And uh, I got this repeatedly um, throughout playing. And then I just thought, well, why, rather than taking offence, I'll play on this. You know, I'll stand on my toes and, and pretend to be an inch taller than I actually am if they already think I, I togged out massive. I'll stand on my tiptoes and just get another half an inch and, and make it even more. I'm going to put my arms wider so they really think that I'm massive every time I end up and play. And so it's, it's about how you take something of a negative 
and really save us new eyes to say, well, how can I turn this to my advantage? And it could be weight, it could be ethnicity, whatever it is. But, you know, people are going to say things in life that majority of the time they might not even mean, you know, sometimes they will, but, you know, majority of the times they won't actually mean what they say, especially in the heat of a moment. So that's why it's very important to try and depersonalize it. Um, especially for young girls, because we know the traditions of the athletic triad, you know, the pressure of having the body um, and the pressure of the image that is already there in society for females. And to be honest, the men are not remiss from this now. There's a serious increase in, in the likes of eating disorders for young men as well because of the societal pressure. And it's really about learning about yourself and trying to joust through that. Um, so the likes have shown the courage that Becky has shown to bring it to air, yeah, but to equally just say, it doesn't vex me, you know, it doesn't change her skill, doesn't change her talent, doesn't change her ability to transform a game, doesn't change her ability to put shockwaves into the heart of a defence. So it's about trying to kind of save with new eyes to say, right, well, I'm getting this in the neck. Maybe that's not a bad thing. You know, maybe that's actually a sign that I'm a threat to this person or this team. So I'll take it. And I suppose if we were to do a review of all ex-county players and compile what has been said to them um, throughout their career, whew, that, that's a book none of us would want to read. Um, but again, it's resilience. So that I always find that by the time I moved in, especially when I was doing uh, my PhD, and you were getting ripped to shreds by professors um, every time you submitted something, you could just take it in the chin and say, all right then, I'll go again. And, the, and because you'd already been through that in sport time and time again, whereas you would witness other people who maybe didn't come from a sporting background, first time they got negative feedback, they cried and they left, you know. Mm. So it's not a bad thing. It's just about, it's, it, it's a bad thing if you let it inside your head and it puts you off doing what you're gifted at doing. And it puts you off being a leader or a role model or letting those gifts and talents shine. It's a good thing if it allows you to get stronger because those same gifts and talents will shine even more. So for young people, if they're getting bullied, you know, I was bullied at school. I would say, you know, it can end up being the greatest experience of your life, depending on what you do with it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's powerful. So there's so much stuff coming into my head when you're talking there. Um, and then I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm mates with a, with, with, with a guy on, on Facebook who was severely bullied in, in school and, and to watch that even, you know, I still, I still have those, those memories of him being absolutely tormented. It's, it, it was crazy what happened, but, um, Claire, just in, in your own role, it's referee and player development. And I'd like to just, you know, as I tend to do on, on these calls, I like to shoot the breeze. I'm thinking of referees and what they have to go through. Um, uh, in, in ter and we've seen a couple of examples last year, you know, a referee makes a call, not everybody agrees with it, social media lights up, he's this, he's that, she's this, she's that, she's the other. Um, and that peer support then is very important because you will see the refereeing community will rally around that referee and, and there'll be phone calls and are you okay? And that's really important, Claire, because I, I suppose in, in terms of, of that and, and the profile of our refs, I suppose in one sense we're victims of our own success. They're more high-profile individuals now and they're subjected to TV scrutiny, etc., etc. So I, I think that's just something to, to touch on, Claire. Yeah, look, definitely. We had a couple of, a couple of incidents last year as well um, where the referee was you know, named and put out there for, for a decision and whether the decision is right or wrong, uh, first of all, people don't know the rules uh, to the, in depth the way the referee does. Second of all, the referee is usually the closest person to that play and, and they're never trying to, you know, win a game or lose a game for a team. You know, these people are really professional, giving up so much of their time, giving up and travelling for hours, putting a whole team of professionals together and, um, you know, then, as you say, Jackie, social media just, just lights up and, and thinking of, sort of two particular incidents last year that we had it and I can't say how much them referees depended on the support around them and and that's one thing about the referee community it is really really tight we have 30 refs on our national panel at the minute and they would just rally when anything like that sort of happens they would all be texting straight away or ringing and and me myself you know I I would ring the referees the next day, no matter if it was the weekend or not, you know, and if something I know has come up and I've flicked through social media and I've seen the abuse because the family that have 
they have wives or, or husbands or partners and children. And I always just like to check in and they say, you know, I've seen that. How are you? And th they would start going on about the decision. I say, I would say, no, 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 I'm not talking about the decision. We'll go through that in, in, a, in another time. I'm asking how you are, yeah. you know, how you feeling? How's the wife? How's the kids? Um, you know, and just have a chat with them. I would always say, look, we're here and don't be gone. And the big thing we would always say, Jackie, and you know that we say, don't be gone near social media. <laughs> don't be going on it. Turn off the phones, go for a walk with the family, have a dinner, just relax for a couple of days. And I'll touch base with you in a couple of days. And I always do follow up and touch base again. But in that meantime, Jackie, as you said, they would say to me, Claire, such and such is rang me, such and such is text me, such and such is said, it'll all blow over. And um, they show, to me, they show, so much resilience every time they go out onto the pitch because it is not an easy job and it can be a very lonely job and uh, they show great courage uh, and I'm, I'm I'm delighted to have the opportunity to work for them I never worked so closely with, with a group of refs like that before until I, this role I'm in and I love the variety between working with the players and working with the referees and seeing everything that goes on behind it but I must say they, to me they show extreme nearly resilience and courage every time they go out onto the pitch yeah, I'd agree with that. Lynette, just on the, on the overall piece, and I'll, I'll put this one to you as well, Sarah, as a player and, and a social media user. Lynette, obviously, when you started out, the work that you were doing, social media was not the animal or the beast that it is now. But how much or how cognizant or increasingly cognizant of it have you become in more recent times and the, the, the potential that social media has for good and bad? Um, massive. I don't have it. Uh, and it's the one piece of advice that I give most people. Your best friends, the people who really care for you, they will be in your contact book of your phone. And you don't need to know what everybody else thinks of you. What other people think of you is of absolutely no concern. And it's outside your control. So you need to very, very quickly weigh up. Are you a person that can read all of that? And turn it into good and if not then switch it off you know we would have had the hogan stand you know when we were playing at the county and every few months you would have somebody would have said did you see what was written on the hogan stand about you um and we would have just, i would have always just said no and i know other players who would have went to find it and to read it i never read it at all i just said thanks for letting me know i, I don't need i don't need it i don't need to worry about it i don't need the headspace wrecked i don't need to get it inside my head so we all have to be very careful in terms of we can think that we're able to deal with an awful lot and the people who say those things don't really realize how much any other person can take and this is what i would say to someone who uses social media like the likes of twitter or facebook and um, be very careful with what you write because we all know what we can give out but we don't know how, how much any other one person can take on um, so that's why, you know, old wisdom, if you've nothing good to say, say nothing at all. Um, in the same token, if there's nothing good to read, read nothing at all. So I'm not on any of those. We do youth retreats in schools and we, we challenge the young people. And to be honest, um, the majority of the young people are saying to us they know that social media is a problem. They know that the boundaries are a problem and they just wish someone could take it off. But the fear of missing out um, and the fear of being the outsider is, is too tough. A, a challenge as someone who opted to go and be the outsider it's a great place <laughs> so um you know have a bit of courage and, and be different you know and have a bit of courage and say do you know what if there's nothing good on that if i'm not coming off that media platform feeling better about myself feeling educated or feeling positive why am i there um, and we can all make a simple decision to say i'm out of there and and we always say to the young ones you know i've done that um, I still breathe, very happy, very peaceful life. And, you know, there's, there's no real backlash because whatever backlash is happening virtually, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> You're spot on there. If, if I could rid it from my life just a little bit, I think I'd be a happier person when I look at the, my weekly screen reports coming in. And I know it's it's part of work, but I'll tell you what, if social media hadn't been invented, uh, I think we might be in a better space overall. Um, <laughs> it's used well. You yes know. no there as i say there are good and bad elements of it but uh, i think it's the time that i spend on it. i need to i need to take a, a look at um sarah where are you on the whole me uh, social media piece um fan not a fan occasional fan 
Uh, I'd say an occasional fan, yeah. It's definitely what Lynette said there. It's just the fear of missing out and just kind of being part of it. And definitely think different generations like have adapted to it differently. And like for mine, I don't know anybody that doesn't really have it, but um, a good few of my friends actually would just kind of delete it here and there, just being like, I just need a break. Mm. And it's sad when you hear that because it's like that used to be the break from normality. And now normality is the break from the internet and everything you need to step back from social media. But, um, you yeah, know, I have notifications turned off and everything because I just feel like it's if it's there, like, and it's pinging the whole time, you're just so drawn to it and you're just kind of, you need to separate yourself from a good good amount of time. Like, um, but that's when like peer support and everything comes into it so much that you just, like, you're not relying on, say for me when I did this like I wasn't relying on Instagram or anything for that didn't benefit me whatsoever but it was the coaches it was all my friends who would text me like in my contact books and like that's what would get you through it and then you kind of go on to social media and kind of see just yeah you wouldn't come off it with a positive outlook and just like literally what Lynette said there yeah. you're just leaving it and you're like oh why am I going on this really yeah, it's a God be with the days and then I suppose for, for, for the younger the younger folk and I don't want to generalize whereby they would just talk to each other rather than looking at a social media channel for validation. It's just it's a it's a it's a discussion we could spend another entire show on. Um Claire, we're bouncing from A to B to C to D, but I think we've hit on a lot of the uh, of the of the key points here in terms of our overall uh overarching um look at peer support and and resilience and you know as as i like to go on a little bit of a tangent now and again on these chats as you know um uh, have we covered most of what we wanted to get from today's show lynette or, or sorry claire yeah i think maybe just and one of the other bits to hit is we are starting Over. to come out of lockdown um great i'm obviously based in belfast and antrim the lovely accent and uh we were back on the pitch the yeah, you're time. all doing it too fast up there. Stop, yeah. slow down. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was brilliant. I was out on the pitch Wednesday night. I was out on the pitch Thursday night. Just felt like a new person. But one thing, and I, I'd like to say to the girls about this maybe, that struck me, Jackie, I took the first training session. I'm taking an under-16 team. And three different girls approached me during the session to say, oh, my God, I'm so crappler. And I couldn't believe it. So they, they, they said, I'm so crap. Yeah, I'm crap. I can't run anymore. I can't catch the ball. I can't. I was just, I just went. Phew. So like, Lynette, that, that, la that labeling of themselves is not great. But at the same time, they're coming out of a situation that they've never experienced before. So yeah. maybe it's, a, it's an overall, I feel crap. They probably yeah. meant to say or something like that. Well, and, and the same token, you know, I remember the first week back every year, counting used to question, did I ever play football before? <laughs> because the ball was, so I think it's reaffirming that for the young people as well. We've had our minors out as well the last few weeks and they're all saying, I, I can't solo. And you're like, look, hang on a second here. We've effectively been in prison for a year, you know. So we it's nearly like a rehabilitation program we're in now, whereby we have to say, look, you used to do that with your eyes closed. We have a bit of ground to make up now. And so just be patient. I would say to the young ones, you know, three to six weeks, you'll look back and laugh at this. Um, so it's not all or nothing. Nobody's expecting you to just hit the all-star mark within the first session. So yeah. again, you can't compare to where you, where you finished off before lockdown um, because a lot has changed. And I suppose our experience with the minor girls the last um, week and a half is just excitement, bubbling excitement. Why? Because guess what? We are human beings. We are made to meet eye to eye. We are made to be in close proximity. We are made to be real and to be in the presence of each other. So one piece of advice that I would leave for young people and well, for society at large is do what you naturally would have done before COVID. So if you know someone's hurt, or you know someone is sick, or if you know someone has lost someone that they love, if your natural reaction before COVID was to go to the door, you can still go to the door and stay two meters apart, you know, but just still go be real with people. Um, and I think that's what we need, you know, our young people and it's not their fault. What else did they have this last year? Only social media, you know, and it's such a poor substitute. So we can't say, oh, well, it's awful that you're on the phone at three o'clock. It's all they could do for a year. And now it's about trying to put other really good options onto the table to say the crack's going to be made of football. 
do you want to come or you know come with us we're going to go for a meal god willing very soon come sit in our garden and have the crack you know so to try and really just connect it we talk about social connectedness all the time best will in the world we're not socially connected throughout this COVID. so get back you know get back as quick as you can and um, as safe as you can we all kind of know uh, to wash everything and all the rest nowadays but to really be real with people I think there's such a need for that and um, especially the likes of Sarah I'm sure Sarah wouldn't be turning anybody away if the girls landed down for a bit of crack at the door and she was sitting doing a rehab while they were chatting around her you know it's just being real and having there, there's a brilliant energy that we bring um, towards each other and when someone's down you don't you don't even have to talk about the injury you don't have to talk about what has them down sometimes you can talk about the most Pile, the biggest pile of nonsense to have them laugh for an hour and let them just forget all about it and that's the cheapest therapy we can have so to really get back to that as quick as possible would be great brilliant i'm, I'm going to finish with you um sarah uh, uh lynette i must ask you by the way is it dr lynette hughes dr lynette mcshane dr lynette hughes mcshane <laughs> what what how should we refer to you as i, I have a, a crisis of identity um, <laughs> Just professionally, nowhere else. Um, whenever I tried to change everything across my married name, but nobody in the sporting world took on at all. They kept saying, no, you're not McShane now. No, we don't know you like that. So I just had to go back to Cusey. Yeah. <laughs> Even my husband calls me Cusey. So yeah. I, I don't get McShane anywhere except on paper. So yeah, I'm McShane by marriage, uh, I have no problem with it, but it just seems to be in the sporting world, people have stuck hard and fast to Hughes. Well, well, we'll keep with Dr. Lynette Hughes, so if that's okay for the purposes of, of here, thanks a million. Um, uh, Sarah, just going back to, to, to your good self, um, I remember actually on, on college placement working with, with, with an inter-county team and we uh, uh, two of them were coming back from ACLs at the same time. And what we did was we clipped um, some footage of them in action. So if they were ever feeling down, that, that you know, they were visualizing what it would be like to be back, you know, running, jumping. They were hurlers, striking, um, catching all the various skills. But Sarah, like you know, you, you, you're in a, you're in the take of it at the moment with rehab. It's a battle. It's it's day by day. But you know that the, you can get back to where you were, which must be a real sense of comfort, and 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 that those good days will come again. Yeah, definitely. I think that was something I was very fearful of the last time I did it, that my first question to the surgeon was, will I be able to run as fast? Will I be able to do everything I was able to do? Like, And he's like, you'll be able to do it even better. And I think that's definitely true that in cases like this, um, like coming back from COVID and everything, like, yeah, it's not going to be the same when you go back, like both the women said. Uh, but once it takes a couple of weeks, like you're able to get into it, it's grand, but um, it does take that kind of bit of adjustment. And I think I've been extremely lucky with my kind of change of perspectives that I've had the support system around me with family and then coaches and then just the teams around me. Like I have, I'm very close to my club team and then the county girls as well, all, all just very good support systems. So I have been extremely lucky with that. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. Like I remember going back when I first did my knee, I felt like I was a horse with blinders on. Like I had no clue I where I was on the pitch. The ball was going. I was like, I had no clue how I did it before. And I was only on for 15 minutes, but I came off just stunned. Like being like, I don't know how to do. I don't know how to play football anymore. Like so, it does take a while to adjust back, but that's it's normal. Like we wish you well on your journey. We wish you well, and you will get there, sir. We look forward to seeing you back in 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 the short again. Um, Claire, before I wrap up, I'm just going to actually go back to Dr. Lynette Hughes and, 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 and Lynette, you've seven kids. So what are, what's the age range? Because if you talk about resilience here, right, I have three and I think I have my hands full. So go on. I don't have enough hands. <laughs> um, the age range, the eldest just turned 11. So it, it takes a bad look of it. He, he turned 11 a few weeks ago. Oh and, uh, the youngest is four months. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. I didn't know it was that recent. Well done. Yeah, so yeah, talk about resilience, you know. Well, funny, oh, how you do it after my first child, one of the first things I did was I sent a message to an ex manager and thanked him for all the two minute runs he had made me do because it made labor, labor bearable. <laughs> 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 because was, the, the contractions lasted around the same length. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I can't say I've ever experienced labour, but I, it's a very <laughs> good analogy. Yeah, but um, <laughs> no, you, like again, I suppose the same thing with transitions. I would, I would be honest, even to say to girls, you know, people would have said to me, "Oh, you're mad! I can't believe!" Like I went back playing football right up till after the fifth. I had a, a, a bad experience with the sixth, a hemorrhaging, so I wasn't able to get back to sport as quick. But I played right back after all five within about four weeks. I was back and people were saying, you're mad. And I suppose the same thing with, again, a transition, each new child. I think it does you a really good service to sit and say, well, who am I now? You know, so what what can I still do? What do I need to park a wee bit? Um, and so when I listen to other friends and they're talking about box sets, I'm like, well, good luck with that. I've, I've parked ever seen the TV for a long time. Um, so it just makes you a better time manager, makes you more efficient. So I focus on the essentials. What are the things that are really essential? What are the things that are going to make me a better mommy, better wife, better person to be around? Um, and how do we just take each day at a time? So you're not kind of thinking of all of it together because, you know, it is mad, but it's our madness. Um, so we just try and go with it and enjoy it rather than stressing it out. So like that, any weight transition, whether it's an injury or it's a change of a house, a change of a job, a new child, I still do take a little time out to say, right, and reflect. I just think we're so busy. We all too often just want to be somewhere else instead of saying, well, where am I right now? You know, what has gone on? What's changed for me? What do I need to let go of? And what do I really not want to let go of? And so it's keeping all of the good stuff and ditching the rest. And yeah, it, it, it's doable. Brilliant. And Claire, you, uh, you couldn't have picked two better people to come on today. I swear to God, really, really enjoyed it. And we've probably gone on a bit longer than normal, but I, I was engrossed um, in it. So Dr. Danette Hughes and Sarah Wall, thanks for coming on. Claire, I'll leave you with the last word. Brilliant show. Yeah, just thanks to the lady so much. Um, it's so brilliant. I know Lynette years from college and she's just an inspiration every time she comes on. And um, I was so impressed with Sarah. I'm just delighted to have the chat today. Brilliant. So good to see you folks. And uh, that's been the LGFA show with our emphasis on, on emphasis on peer support and resilience. So Dr. Lynette Hughes, Sarah Wall and Claire Dowdle, thanks very much. No bother. Thanks for having me.